All right. We're live. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is James Kalina. I am the Open Power Foundation uh, Executive Director. Uh, thank you for joining uh, our first uh, LinkedIn Live event, and our first actually streaming event from the foundation. Uh, we're here to talk about uh, what's going on in open source hardware, what's going on in the foundations. Uh, today we have uh, Tim Ansel from Google. Uh, we have Michael Gilder from Ant Micro and Rob Maines from the Chip, uh, Chip Alliance Foundation, or the brother in arms at the Linux Foundation here. Uh, so welcome everybody to the stream. And so I'm a little logistics first. Uh, so uh, you can actually post questions in the comments section. Uh, each speaker uh, will be able to see uh, your questions. Uh, we are gonna reserve time at the end for Q and A. So uh, each speaker might uh, may or may not uh, take your questions uh, at that moment and may save them for the end, uh, or they can uh, take it if it's, a, if it's a timely question. So please uh, put your questions into the comments and we'll get to them. All right. So if you don't know uh, who uh, Open Power Foundation is or what we are, so we are actually started uh, in 2013 uh, by a number of different companies and we've grown globally uh, to over 350 uh, plus members. Uh, so we are a nonprofit. We serve our member companies, but we also serve the open hardware industry in general. Um, originally, we we didn't have a fully uh, open uh, ISA. Uh, this, so this was something that we rectified in 2019 to, to great applause from a lot of the uh, community. Uh, this is actually a big, big game changer for us. And it's actually... Um, one of the things that helped us retool the whole foundation moving forward and, and kind of why we're here today and the kind of project we're launching is because of this. So our mission at the foundation is to accelerate the adoption of open power ISA, uh, but also open technology. So complementary technologies uh, in general for the open hardware uh, uh, community. And we do this through uh, driving innovation through our specifications that we develop through certain work groups. Uh, as well as uh, our compliance and verification. So uh, now that we're fully open uh, ISO, you can actually build custom silicon with power. Uh, and we put in place uh, verification and test suites uh, and uh, compliancy so that you make sure that uh, all the software that has already been supported on power will run on your solutions as well. Um, but the biggest thing that we're going to be talking about today that we've changed in the foundation also is uh, product uh, SIGs, what we call special integration groups. Uh, this is something that's new to our foundation, and it's really meant to enable uh, all of our community to be able to develop uh, using power and using uh, open technologies. Uh, and so, you know, we also are, are really focused on growing this ecosystem and growing our, our members uh, and, and engaging with them uh, across a variety of different uh, use cases and uh, uh, solving different problems. Um, and we really help in terms of facilitating that community engagement and the visibility, both from the foundation perspective and what we're up to, but also uh, what our member companies are up to and how they're uh, positively affecting uh, open source hardware and, and pushing innovation through that. Um, and so power has been around for, for a number of decades now. And so it's a, it's a very mature technology. Uh, and uh, we operate in a, a number of different industries. And, uh, but what we're really trying to do is, is focus on open technology enablement. So traditionally, we had been a foundation that was focused on consumption of IBM power CPUs. Essentially, we really took the systems integrator type view uh, and trying to make people develop uh, servers and, and uh, kind of data center focused equipment around the uh, power technology. What we're moving to now as a foundation and some of the projects that we're going to be talking about uh, is really a product focused project. So we retooled actually the, the OPF, the foundation to allow for SIGs. And this is not some, some small feat. We actually had to do a lot of legal things and uh, processes and a whole bunch of things. And so now we're able to actually launch these new projects uh, and there'll be more projects uh, in the future we able to talk about. Uh, but we also created new rules to allow for non-members to start participating uh, in these work groups as well, which uh, wasn't there before. 
And so we're really trying to get as many people involved in looking at uh, open open power technology as well as open uh, technology in general that's complementary. And so the goal here is to provide this basis uh, for others to build uh, new products across uh, software, silicon, and systems. Uh, and enable these complementary technologies uh, in the open uh, hardware space. Uh, our first kind of product SIG that we've launched recently is what we call the Liver VMC. And so for those who don't know, the baseboard management control is a pretty uh, essential component in IT uh, hardware. Uh, it's pretty much in every single major server on the planet and it provides more, uh, remote management and access and control for servers. And what we've done is kind of taken it to its natural uh, conclusion where we're already starting to see the open uh, source software world take uh, take what was run currently running proprietary solutions running on these chips and uh, created open BMC. Uh, so that's an open source firmware that people can uh, participate in and collaborate and actually develop on. Uh, what we're doing now is developing a module that will have an FPGA uh, running uh, a Power ISA soft core. And the reason why we did with an FPGA for this project was uh, development. So we want to make sure that we uh, can move fast and can try different things, uh, as well as there's there's uh, uh, around the tooling as well. So um, talking about open uh, technologies that complement the, the power architecture and what we're trying to do, tooling is a very big, big thing. And by allowing us to use FPGAs and to focus on development of, uh, of that, we're able to actually incorporate these fully open uh, tools uh, such as SimbiFlow and LightX. Um, we've also adopted an open source specification for the module itself. Uh, we took from uh, OCP. So we're all about collaborating with different foundations. Uh, and one of the specifications that we adopted for this project is called the DCSEM, the Data Center Security Control Management uh, Hardware Module. So this is a module uh, that would go into a server that would have uh, the BMC on, on top of it. Uh, typically, these BMCs are, are soldered onto the server. Uh, we're initially going to be supporting uh, Xilinx Arctic 7 as well as uh, Lattice uh, ECP5 for this. So we're really excited about this project. Uh, we've, we've had initial uh, project uh, uh, meetings and launches, um, and we're working on specifications, we're working on designs, um, and we have a number of uh, companies uh, already uh, collaborating and, and, and looking at this project. Um, some of the people on this call uh, are, are some of those companies and those people who are participating. Um, so if you're very, if you're interested in uh, getting involved, um, uh, reach out because this is something that we're really excited about and to bring to the forefront and, and to really solve uh, a problem in the in the BMC space and provide innovation there. The other thing that I want to talk about is it's not so much. Um, a project as much as a retooling uh, to allow us uh, for greater flexibility and speed, which is the Power ISA itself. So this is the main work group within the foundation, and we've retooled this work group as well and have relaunched it. And it's it allows for participation of members, but also we've allowed the ability for non-members to actually participate through certain processes and certain means. Uh, and the reason why we wanted to do this is we're seeing a lot of um, companies that aren't necessarily your chip makers. Uh, wanting to then go into custom, you know, domain-specific computing, uh, figuring out ways to solve their problems and develop new chips. And uh, we want as many people to be able to have, provide access to this kind of technology and to get involved and to solve their problems. So our goal really here is to provide mechanisms for the evolution of the Power ISA, but we've also stood up, you know, uh, compliancy and verification um, so that we make sure that whatever you're developing, uh, if you're adopting the Power ISA, uh, it will be compliant, it will run software, and so you don't have to worry about uh, uh, fragmentation within the industry. Um, and the, the one uh, thing that we're really emphasizing with this work group is the fact that you can actually pick and choose uh, on a certain subset of instructions. So I think one of the misinformations around power is that it's this huge unwieldy beast in terms of an ISA. And in actuality, uh, it can get very large if you want to adopt every single instruction set that uh, the Power ISA has created. Uh, but you can actually just pick and choose subsets of that, uh, which provides a lot of flexibility in what you're trying to develop. So they can really just target your specific use case and not worry about instructions that you'll never use. 
Um, and so the whole goal here is to an hour, uh, to enable uh, new power-based CPUs for targeting industrial IoT, edge data centers, HPC, AI, ML, um, the whole gamut. And one of, one of the projects that um, I want to talk about is that we're launching very soon is what we call the Power Pi. Um, and so we've always had an issue uh, around getting access to power systems because they are uh, very um, high performing systems. And, and so uh, to, in order for us to move this forward, both on tooling, both on uh, software and, and on hardware in general, you need to give access to a low cost solution for people to put on their desk to play around with. Um, and so we're we're kickstarting and launching this new project. And this is kind of the aggregation of all the different things that we're working on here at the foundation. We're gonna be developing uh, a new SOC. Uh, we're gonna be developing a board that uh, in a lot of ways mimics uh, what we see as a as Raspberry Pi, you know, with headers and things that you can actually uh, do hacking on and whatnot. Um, and it's gonna be affordable for developers then get their hands on um, a lot of these things. Um, and then we're gonna be providing uh, platforms uh, for them to uh, uh, test benches and, and, and kind of tooling around it. Um, uh, so this is something we're very excited about launching and uh, we look forward to seeing uh, how you guys respond and hopefully you collaborate and want to be participating. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done here, uh, but it's all very good things and uh, we're just super excited about it. Uh, so if you do want to engage with uh, our, our foundation and our community in general, you can always email uh, me at ED at Open Power Foundation, uh, also our TSC chair, our marketing, our social media, uh, and you can always reach out to me on Twitter uh, at James uh, at James Kalina or our, our Open Power Foundation uh, Twitter account at Open Power Org. Um, I'm going to hand it off now to Tim Ansel from Google. He's going to talk a little bit about open tools. Uh, so Tim. Hi everyone. Um, hi, I'm Tim, and uh, you can find my slides at uh, this uh, link here. Um, and uh, Google is interested in uh, open source hardware tool chains uh, because really everything is about this loop. Um, the loop of going from uh, an application to some type of description, to an implementation and going around that loop as fast as possible is really a key to being successful and create uh, you know, the most value in the shortest amount of time. Um, generally, we find it very hard to understand something until it's actually running in production. And so we want to make that as quick as possible. Um, this loop, though, uh, while it looks simple, hides a lot of complexity. Um, and we're very interested in seeing all these things uh, be fully open source and accessible. Um, so Google is investing in open tooling. And we have a long history of investing in open tooling. Um, we invested very heavily in things like machine learning with TenderFlow and Kubernetes with cloud. And so we're investing in open source hardware tooling because we believe it enables innovation, it enables new experiments, and enables new products. Um, the, my team at Google is working on um, uh, four different primary prongs um, in this area. And we have a uh, reasonably large team working on that. Um, it consists of Googlers, contractors, and a few others, um, open source developers. Um, System Verilog is a very important language from an industry point of view. And so we've been focusing on improving System Verilog support in open source uh, tooling. Um, it kind of fits here. And Henna Zella on my team has been given the task of making System Verilog uh, first uh, class citizen in all open source tools. Um, this is interesting and it helps both ASIC and FPGA tooling. And it also heavily helps the simulation and testing um, tools as well, which are used again in both. Uh, the system Verilog stuff has two primary prongs. Um, of these two primary prongs, uh, 
One is a system Verilog parser called Verable. Um, this is a tool mainly targeted at developer tooling. Um, you can think of things like Clang Format, CPP, Lint, Code Search, all that type of stuff. Um, we also have another uh, system Verilog uh, parser that we're investing in called Shorelog that's targeted at both simulation and synthesis. You can kind of think of it as the front end for um, like C++. And so uh, the goal here is to share as much as we can between uh, different users. So we also have a thing called the UHDM, which is a uh, abstraction of the front end. It's not supposed to be an IR. It's more like an advanced abstract tree. Um, so that's the system Verilog stuff we're investing in. But we're also investing on implementation of uh, systems, both in FPGA tooling and in ASIC tooling. Uh, in the FPGA tooling, we're investing heavily in existing open source technologies like Yosis, Verilog to routing, and other um, uh, similar technologies. And you might know this externally as the Simberflow project. Uh, the Simberflow project aims to be fully open source. It aims to be multi-platform, vendor neutral, and have a growing community around it. You can kind of see the important parts of this project uh, listed here. And we're investing in multiple different groups in this area. Um, we've gotten to a stage with Simberflow where we have actually quite decent support for multiple vendors' parts. Um, we have support for Xilex FPGAs um, in the 7 Series. We have support for Lattice um, parts. And we have support for QuickLogic parts. Uh, definitely microcontroller-sized projects are 100% uh, doable. Um, you can think of things like uh, you know, MicroPython, Zephyr, TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. Um, we can also do pretty well uh, what I call embedded Linux size projects. Think of your Raspberry Pi Zero and similar type class. And we're also investing in the ecosystem around this. Uh, this is things like LightX and soft CPU, especially RISC-V and power. Um, you know, things like PCI Express, USB 3, um, pretty much anything that allows you and every system uh, needs to get stuff done. Um, we're looking at how can you build an ecosystem where most people who are doing hardware accelerated development don't need to worry about the complexities of memory or how it's connected to the computer, whether that's Ethernet, PCI Express, uh, USB 3, or anything else. Um, when we first started this, FPGA vendors were pretty skeptical about our work. Um, but that's starting to change. Uh, QuickLogic became uh, the first vendor to actually officially support and invest in open source tools with um, their Cork initiative and their Quick Feather development board. But even the big guys are starting to um, understand the importance of this. Uh, we've been collaborating with Xilex around, for example, releasing as much of the Unisim libraries as they can under open source licenses like Apache 2. And we're now collaborating with them on a open source FPGA interchange format to allow people to create uh, place and route tools for their hardware um, very easily. Um, we're also uh, engaged very strongly with the academic community. Um, we're seeing a lot more papers now around open source tooling. And we have many students from different uh, universities engaging with us. Um, if you look at things like uh, Verilog to Routing from the University of Toronto, um, they've had massive improvements in their performance. Uh, things like 41% uh, reduction in wire length and 5x faster uh, performance speed up. And some of their tests are some of the largest tests uh, that any uh, body out there is currently running. Um, we're talking, you know, 4 million LUT type size designs. 
And the tools can actually complete most of those examples these days. Um, we've also engaged with groups like the University of Pennsylvania, where they're looking at alternative ways to speed up place and route using uh, divide and conquer style approaches. Um, this uh, took a compile time that uh, used to be 42 minutes and got it under five minutes using the open source tools. Um, we're also trying to build out the ecosystem of applications. Um, we've been working very heavily on TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers running on soft CPUs inside FPGAs. And this is paired with things like Litex, uh, VEX Risk Five, and uh, the popular emulation environment Renode uh, from at Micro to enable you to get uh, started with development without having any hardware. Um, so as I said, we're investing in both FPGA tooling and ASIC tooling. And the ASIC tooling is uh, kind of a secondary focus. But one thing we noticed was the lack of fully open source manufacturable PDK um, that could be uh, you know, downloaded. And so we worked with the Skywater uh, Foundry to release a 130 nanometer PDK uh, for that, uh, for their 130 nanometer process. Um, we also paired this with a open source shuttle program where if your design is open source, um, then uh, you can get free tape outs. And the first run of that shuttle was in November last year, and we had 45 designs in 30 days, and of which 60% of the people submitting designs had never done an ASIC before. And these ASICs came from a wide variety of different uh, types of designs. There was everything from you know, satellite radio to EFPGAs uh, to uh, you know, crypto miners, robotic systems, uh, just a huge wide variety of different uh, you know, design types. And MPW2 is now running. And excitingly, if you don't want to make your uh, solution fully open source, eFabless have released their um, Chip Ignite program, which uh, makes it accessible for anyone because you can get a private ASIC done for uh, 10,000 US dollars, or if you want 1,000 ICs at $20 each an IC. Um, to help people understand you know, um, how to do ASIC tooling, uh, we also worked with uh, the Fossey Foundation, around um, having a talk series focused on this. And we also have a thriving uh, Slack channel, which has over 1,500 members on it now. I think this is one of the biggest uh, groups of uh, you know, ASIC developers in one place at the moment. Um, and anybody is welcome to go and join that. I talked a bit about... Um, FPGA tooling and ASIC tooling. But one of the things to note is that ASICs take two plus years to develop, whereas um, I can change FPGA designs in hours. Um, but the traditional thinking tends to think of, you know, CPUs at one end and ASICs at the other end with kind of FPGAs in the middle. Um, and this is kind of the traditional thinking, which uh, I think is uh, incorrect. Every design has parts which continue to modify after you've shipped, and every design have parts that don't. And so what we really need is a combination of all these different styles of systems uh, together. And so we want some uh, designs are going to be very heavy FPGAs. Some designs are going to be very heavy ASIC. Some designs are going to be very heavy CPU. And we want to be able to turn the design uh, dial between the percentages of each without having to adopt new tooling. So what we're really looking for is just unified hardware tooling um, that works on FPGAs. It works on ASICs. It works together. Um, 
And so uh, that's kind of where we're heading and we're excited to see how we can use that in things like the Libra BMC project. And we kind of see this as uh, the same way, you know, TenderFlow changed machine learning and Kubernetes changed the way cloud was doing. Um, we're hoping this investment changes the way hardware development is done with a strong core focused around open source tools. Um, so I invite everyone to come and contribute. Um, I've personally sent lots of people hardware um, so that they can contribute. And there's a wide variety of different types of uh, ways to contribute from, you know, uh, doing things like C++ profiling, Python scripting, you know, documentation, helping the community, just trying new things is something we need people to try. Um, so like, I highly um, encourage everyone to uh, come and, uh, you know, work with us on this exciting stuff. Um, it's gonna need help from everyone and ideas from everyone to really like spark a new innovation of um, hardware tooling that has never existed before. And so I believe uh, next up is um, uh, Michael Gilder from At Micro. Um, is that correct? Or have I got that wrong? No, that should be me. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Michael who's gonna give some interesting, uh, you know, uh, presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, you've obviously mentioned a few things I wanted to speak about, so I'll just skim through them later. Uh, let me take over the screen and try to share my slides. Uh, just don't get scared with how many tabs I have open at all times. Um, OK, so let's do entire screen, I guess. And action. Hopefully, this is visible. Uh, so yeah, I want to talk to you a little bit about open source hardware and practical applications, since I believe momentum is best visualized with you know kind of practical stuff that you do. Uh, and of course, Tim has mentioned a million things already. Hopefully, I can add on top of that. Uh, so uh, a little bit about us. Uh, as a company, we work with different topics, hardware, software, AI, uh, NFPGA and ASIC stuff. And in all of those contexts, we also develop tooling. Uh, so and Micro kind of does lots of things. and. What are these things connected with? Well, open source. Um, and uh, if you want to kind of get a practical view of what we're doing, just go to our website and scroll down to the technology website. You'll see a vast array of you know different things. And again, open source is the common theme. So much so that we have a recently launched open source portal, opensource.entmicro.com. I guess I should have included the link. Uh, that'll kind of showcase some of the things we've been working on. Uh, the first thing I wanted to uh, talk about is open source hardware that we've been developing, uh, um, both in the open power context, but also more generally speaking. Um, first up is the Libre BMC. That's already been mentioned twice today. And uh, that's a very practical problem. Um, you need you know, your service to be controlled. And the BMC, the board management controller, is what does this thing. Uh, but if you want your server to be controlled and booted and, and, and monitored by a certain piece of hardware, you want to make sure that it's a secure and open and flexible and modifiable a piece of hardware. Uh, so our goal in the Libre BMC work group is to develop a platform that has both open software and hardware and also gateware, uh, or FPGIP, as other people call it, uh, that allows you to fully control your BMC. This hardware has been developed by Ant Micro in collaboration with Google. And we've adopted the Open Compute Project's DCSCM specification. And that allows us, of course, to stay compatible with an upcoming you know, range of uh, server products. And uh, we're going to be using uh, the Open Power architecture, of course, because it's the Open Power uh, uh, Foundation that's driving this. But of course, uh, uh, this being an FPGA, uh, it can be programmed with various things. And, and most likely, we'll have RISC-V variants of this as well. Uh, and generally speaking, this is a highly collaborative project. so. Uh, obviously, much of this work is reusable in different contexts. Uh, but Open Power has the, de definitely a primary leading role in this. And of course, uh, as such, it being uh, um, uh, an FPGA that's supported in the Symbiflow toolchain, it's an ideal target for doing completely open source end-to-end -end development, hardware, software, tooling, you name it. 
we already have the Arctic 7 version manufactured and we're currently bringing it up. Uh, it has a fairly decent uh, FPGA, it's 100 kilowatts that you can play around with. Um, and you can read more about this board uh, in a dedicated blog note. There's, of course, a GitHub repository that you can just download this from. It's all done in KiCad. And uh, um, of course, it's also on our open source portal. But generally speaking, uh, this is a fairly rapid development that was kind of built uh, from a very practical need. Uh, now, uh, open source liking variety means that we also have an ECP5 based version. It's a little bit earlier in the development lifecycle, but it's equally interesting. And ECP5 has, generally speaking, been very, very popular with the open source crowd. Uh, so definitely, it's a, it's a high interest project as well. Um, and uh, it's going to be fairly compatible with the first version. Uh, so whatever we develop for the Arctic 7 version should mostly run on ECP5. And the reason is, of course, that we're going to be using open source framework, open source IPs, open source tools. And uh, uh, these kind of uh, uh, building blocks typically pay a very strong attention to portability. And by having two versions of the same module, uh, you can say we have a story of how do we make sure that the entire system is fully portable and doesn't depend on a single uh, FPGA, but rather kind of abstracts out what's important. Mm, so that's about uh, uh, the DCSCM modules that we're developing. I won't dwell on it much more because that's already been kind of covered twice. Uh, we That generally speaking uh, plays into a broader effort from ourselves to uh, develop open source uh, server-oriented hardware. Uh, all of our open hard or open all, all of our designs, hardware designs are open source, and uh, these ones have been created because of our own need. We want we wanted a compute platform we could easily scale, and so um, we developed this uh, project called Scale Node, which allowed us to uh, plug in a lot of Raspberry Pi compute module force into our server room because we need a lot of compute for different projects that we're developing. Uh, we do a lot of software actually, even though I'm talking about hardware so much. Uh, we need a lot of compute. So we developed this as an internal project, but of course it quickly gathered you know, momentum and uh, a lot of uh, interest. Uh, but we also saw that there is an opportunity uh, to put RISC-V in the server room. And so we developed a SOM that's compatible with the compute module 4, but it supports uh, the recently released Star-5 uh, uh, SOC uh, that you also might know from the Beagle 5. Um, so this is going to be pretty exciting. We've had a lot of great input and a, a lot of interest in this RISC-V based SOM. Obviously, it's early days. As you can see, this is still a render. It's not yet a manufactured product. But um, generally speaking, we see RISC-V uh, uh, you know, to be a great opportunity. And of course, uh, as you can imagine, uh, Open Power has a huge role to play in the service as well. And you can imagine you know, various components that you can make compatible uh, with those kind of platforms in order to give people choice, give people the variety they need to build their uh, serve room as, their need, as they need. Moving on to uh, open ASIC and FPG tooling, and I think Tim has done a great job describing all this. Uh, uh, I wanted to give a little bit of a shout out to Chips Alliance. Of course, Rob will probably tell you more about this, but uh, many of the efforts that kind of we're talking about here are driven by, by this community. And uh, it collaborates very closely with Open Power um, and uh, we have similar goals. We want to develop open source tools to support uh, open source hardware development. And we don't just look at tools, we also do IP and interconnects and then cores, of course. Uh, so everything that's related to open source hardware developing open source chips and FPGAs can find its home in Chips Alliance. And of course, kind of the, one of the key projects for you know open source hardware is SymbiFlow. Tim has described it in detail. Um, so definitely go and check out SymbiFlow and try to uh, run it on uh, one of the FPGAs that we support. Uh, and Micro does a lot of development behind SymbiFlow, and uh, we want to make FPGAs boring. We want to make FPGAs something that you can just put into your SOC and uh, use it as if it was a normal CPU. Uh, because we want to make the tool chains disappear. We want to make them open source and, and just seamless. Uh, it's a long way to go. But on the other hand, there's been extreme progress. And uh, uh, definitely, we welcome you to join our effort to open source FPGAs.
And of course, uh, that's going to be very useful for things like uh, Libre BNC and so on. Um, in terms of like different kinds of things we do in the tooling effort, one other uh, uh, thing that we've been building is a test suite for system Verilog support. Uh, Tim has mentioned, you know, all the changes we've been doing in uh, different kinds of uh, open source tools and, and frameworks to support system Verilog. And all of those developments that we're also kind of involved with, we're trying to put in the context of how well are we, uh, you know, how well are we performing and measuring the progress as we go. So we have various kinds of test suites, and SVTest is one of them, where we just measure how well do the different open source tools uh, uh, match against various kinds of system Verilog designs. Uh, you can take a look at the test suite. It has a constantly updated uh, um, um, dashboard of uh, you know results, and obviously we're trying to make this entire uh, dashboard green. One other development that's also been kind of uh, uh, well, Chips Alliance is also to blame is uh, um, event-driven uh, simulation variolator. We've built a stratified scheduler uh, which allows us to run you know event-driven simulations, and this is a very important milestone in order to do UVM in open source. Uh, now, UVM in open source is something that historically hasn't been possible. It's a you know methodology that's being pursued by a vast majority of the ecosystem, of the existing ecosystem, but it's not really supported in open source tools. We want to change that. We want to plug in the recent developments in open source hardware with an existing ecosystem of, of IP, of uh, um, uh, building blocks that can be reused. And uh, enabling open source verification using UVM is going to be a huge milestone. That's still in front of us. That's just one step towards that. But hopefully, uh, this is going to be something we can accomplish in the coming years. And uh, in the meantime, uh, definitely, uh, we wanted to shout out for the Chips Alliance Deep Dive Cafe Talk. Uh, next week, where Carl uh, from Ant Micro will be presenting this work in more detail. Uh, one of the other projects within Chips Alliance and, and being very dynamically developed and, and kind of giving us high hopes for you know open source hardware is Open Road, which is a tool chain for for building uh, open source ASICs end to end. Um, Tim has mentioned this as well. Uh, this is kind of uh, uh, the default way we want people to eventually. Uh, design chips with. And uh, of course, making the entire toolchain open source will practically enable different kinds of AI assisted methodologies or software driven methodologies that are really exciting. Uh, one other thing uh, that we've been developing for very you know practical reasons uh, in this space is called Renode. Uh, which is an open source simulator. And this is actually a tool that we developed for our own needs. It's it's a tool that we built because we felt it was needed. And only afterwards we realized, okay, that's something great that we should potentially open source. And indeed, uh, it turned out that it's a great idea because a lot of people uh, over the years, a lot of people adopted it. Um, of course, Google's TensorFlow Lite team uses it, but so, so is Microchip or Intel or Microsoft and many others. Essentially, everyone developing IoT systems should be working in simulation, should be uh, testing their software without necessarily having access to hardware. Uh, we you know, enable cloud-driven CI for embedded systems. We enable a sharing of results and knowledge and, and testing of metrics and various kinds of uh, uh, um, things that software developers are used to, but hardware developers or embedded developers have historically not been able to do. Um, now, moving on to yet another uh, uh, topic, uh, there's an open source DDR memory controller that we've been working on as a very practical example of you know uh, how open source can also transform you know IP itself, not just tools, not just you know hardware boards, but uh, um, digital design and and IP cores. Uh, the background for for this development has been that you know uh, Google wanted to build an open hardware and software DDR memory research platform, um, and so we we delivered that. We developed a highly configurable and modular. Uh, a platform that includes both hardware, software, and FPGAP, and that's based on Light DRAM. Um, we developed LPDDR support for it because that was the main focus of the project. Uh, we also have we are developing you know DDR5 support, which is in progress now. And uh, of course, uh, we created this board that's the main research platform, 
uh, that's what it looks like. Um, it's a pretty interesting platform. Uh, it kind of allows us to measure the vulnerability of different memory chips to ROM attacks. Uh, the memory is on modules so that you can easily replace it and test various memories with the same uh, FPGA platform. And we're working on, of course, uh, enabling more test beds for memories. And uh, yeah, this research is ongoing, so it's it's pretty awesome. Uh, you can read more about both the hardware platform and the link that you'll have access to later. And uh, in fact, the results of this uh, entire story are already being published. Uh, we have this uh, half double attack that was uh, you know, discovered using this platform. Uh, and this uh, is a very interesting read. I encourage you to go there and read Google's uh, write-up on, on the half double. So hopefully, I've been able to tell you a little bit about how you can kind of enable really practical applications of open source. Uh, and I can pass uh, uh, now the microphone, so to say, to Rob, who should be after me, I believe. Thank you so much, Mike. I sincerely appreciate your talk and uh, Tim's as well and uh, James uh, too. Very informative. Sincerely appreciate it. So my name is Rob Maines. I am the general manager of Chips Alliance. I uh, started with uh, Chips back in uh, January and it's uh, my uh, sincere appreciation for this opportunity. It's uh, something new for me in terms of my career. I've been in industry for quite some time. So what I want to do is just kind of provide some context and motivation for Chips Alliance and in general the open source hardware community. As you can see here relative to my email that uh, you know Chips is part of Linux Foundation along with Open Power and OS5. There is tremendous momentum in the open hardware community. And there is a degree of skepticism. I know this from many of my colleagues who I've worked with uh, in proprietary type systems in the past, but there is definitive momentum on many different aspects of this. And I think it's something that needs to be taken seriously and also that it enables a wide spectrum of uh, innovative individuals to help contribute and companies to help do things in a new and innovative way. Similar to what Tim was saying in the Google presentation of what they're trying to do, which is effectively to disrupt the way that things have traditionally been done. And, and if you look at it, that's historically how innovation does occur. So if we look at what I call industrial evolution, you know, we've gone really, and, and this cycles through history, I will readily admit to that, but we go from what I call a soups to nuts silo. Everything is done in-house. You know, you would see that with companies like General Electric that years back had its own foundry to pour things. Uh, to doing their own uh, EDA development, to doing chip design, computers, you know, you name it, they would do everything. IBM was a very similar story too, right? That they had their own foundry, they had their own EDA tooling, everything, design, compilers, software, et cetera. To where now it's more of what I call a supply chain management type of environment. In other words, just in time delivery. You rely upon a contract a foundry, of which there are several, and they've done a great job in terms of developing that and they work closely with their partners. And companies manage that appropriately, right? So there will be different suppliers to provide you with like chips, as an example. Could be uh, EDA tooling, it could be software applications, et cetera, right? So that type of thing. But now we're also seeing where we're moving more towards an open collaboration environment. And you're, you've heard that today in the talks provided by, by the team. And a lot of this is there's for different reasons for this. One of them, of course, is cost, right? That is very expensive to fully develop and maintain your own stack. And you can define stack however you want to. But the fact is, is that it's very expensive to maintain, to enhance, and to continue to propagate. Whereas those that venture into open collaboration will see these costs mitigated across a pool of interested parties and developers. It also will allow for innovative and disruptive thought to come to the table much more quickly than what you see in corporate silos. As many know, or you all know perhaps, is that typically in large companies or corporate silos, there's different uh, factions, if you will, that will prohibit innovation from coming forward. Open collaboration allows for that disruptive type of thinking to happen. And so you may say that, well, you know, this just, this is all nice, but it's really not going to happen. Well, you may recall that at one point in time, there were many different types of operating systems. And if we look back in the early 90s, as an example, there were many types of OSs, right? So there was VAX VMS. That's when I first started my own software career or my own work was back in that time period, right? Back in the early 80s. And of course, you know, IBM has many different types of operating systems that it's developed over the years and continues to develop and support. 
Uh, Microsoft, of course, has Windows, IBM had OS2 at one point in time, some of you may remember. And then one of my employers, too, of course, had uh, Sun Solaris. But out of all that came something called Linux. And that was really a def different way of thinking, right, that uh, Linus Torvalson put forward back in the early 90s. And the success of that at the time was certainly not guaranteed. There were many skeptics. I would say that myself is a, was a skeptic, too. It's kind of similar to foundries back at that point in time when uh, such, the likes of TSMC first came about. You know, the, again, there was skepticism, right? But the point being relative to Linux is that it really started a uh, momentum or a revolution, if you will, in terms of software development and how things can move forward. And operating systems, of course, are not a trivial thing to develop, right? The kernel in particular is a, is a tricky area. But as has been seen in the open source community, this really has changed things. So this led to the formulation of the Linux Foundation back then. And right now, there's over 1,500 members from 40 different countries. There's 100% of the Fortune 100 companies are participant. And there are many different areas where Linux Foundation has uh, gone into, including the hardware arena, as I'd mentioned earlier, but also in terms of security, networking, cloud, automotive, blockchain, to name a few, right? And of course, edge IoT type of devices. So it really has grown significantly. It has a significant number of developers who participate in this and contribute. And companies are leveraging this strength of the overall community to help bring new ideas to the table and advance the state of the art. And companies, of course, build their own value proposition on top of the open source software that is being developed. Similarly, in the hardware space, we will see the same thing as well, that this will create a foundation for hardware developers to contribute new ideas. It also will be true for open source tooling, that different contributors will participate in this and build upon this in a similar type of things. It also will result in the construction of new business models to support and develop these types of things. Ant Micro, the company that uh, Michael uh, works with or works for, is an example of a new type of business model that helps enable this. So what are we seeing in the hardware space, right? So it's really, we're seeing a revolution. If you go back in time, the, you know, the amount of hardware that existed, so to speak, was fairly minimal or fairly small, but we are now seeing an explosion. And I think we've all become aware of this, right, with relative to the semiconductor shortage that has become apparent and that it's in everyday type of appliances or use cases, right? So this is only going to continue to increase with the advent of 5G communication, which is both cellular and Wi-Fi based type speeds, uh, advanced computing, whether that be quantum or other types of special purpose computing, or in healthcare in terms of continuous monitoring of different health systems. The overall level of devices and comp computational platforms that exist will only continue to increase. And hence, this becomes a very large ecosystem that needs to be supported and also developed. And that occurs best when done in a collaborative fashion. So that's what Chips Alliance is about, in fact. It's really an organization which develops and hosts open source hardware specification, implementation, verification. And when I say hardware specification, we are not particular to any one particular CPU core or device. We work closely with RISC V, we work with Open Power, we're open open or interested in working with other folks on different types of things. And they could be many different types of computational devices, as an example, right? It can be traditional CPUs, or it can be IoT specialty type of devices, or machine learning accelerators, or database accelerators, you know, many types of things. There's, of course, IO, memory, CERTES type work, CERTES, networking type of interfaces, machine learning accelerators. We also has a very wide interest in open source tooling, whether that be for ASIC or FBGA type development. And I will say that there are, again, many naysayers or skeptics in this area as well, but there has been tremendous progress in terms of building this community and helping move this forward as both Tim and Michael have shared with you. And this goes into the areas of composition, electro electrical verification, verification, simulation, the whole spectrum. And as Michael had mentioned, we have created a number of different work groups to help address these different challenges. In fact, CHIPS actually acts as a barrier-free environment for collaboration and allows for or creates different types of work groups, whether that be on uh, interconnect architecture, uh, shared memory architecture as an example, chiplets ecosystem we're working on, many different areas 
that uh, we participate in. And the idea is to allow for different players to come to the table to collaborate and participate in development. We have the Apache 2 license framework that we use typically for uh, legal part collaboration. And we encourage IP contribution, but of course, it's not required. In fact, we have a number of folks, as an example, participating in our analog work group that are not yet members of CHIPS, but we do value their participation and they help. Again, the overall idea is to provide for shared resources, which would help reduce the cost and time required to develop new ideas in both tooling and hardware. So in sum, I call this the concentric collaborative innovation and open echo open design ecosystem, right? There's many participants, as I mentioned, individuals, universities, foundations, industry. We have about 27 members right now as part of CHIPS Alliance. It's continuing to grow. We get different interests you know, from many people as this starts to take forward. And again, this goes all the way from specification out to standards. And of course, a part important part of that is the PDK, as Tim mentioned earlier, and also tooling to allow us to develop different types of things. And we welcome contributions on all fronts. So with that, I will turn it back to James uh, for questions and comments. And Tim, great talks. Uh, so I actually just wanted to kind of pose some questions here that we can all talk about. Um, you know, Rob, you mentioned around this transition from this siloed approach now to an open collaboration. Um, how, was that, how was that actually going? Like we have, we have these foundations. We're, we're seeing it in real time right now. We're, you and I were representing different uh, foundations. We're collaborating with different companies. Both oh. of these companies that are on the call today actually operate in both of our foundations. Right. Um, so how is this going? How is this going to accelerate? How can we get this moving in in a way that uh, we can really see some progress in the open source hardware space and ecosystem? I think that's a great question, and. Uh, you know, I kind of, the analogy I kind of use is you know, I, I downhill ski amongst many activities, but you know, it, it, it's kind of a little bit like looking down a double belt black diamond slope, right? And you think to yourself, well, I think I can do this and I think I'll come out okay, but I'm not really sure. But so my point is, is that as you see momentum build upon this, you will start to see other participants uh, join in this. and. I think we are on the brink, if you will, of seeing that kind of momentum. I think we're seeing that with open power. I think we're seeing that with risk five and particularly as the ecosystem grows in terms of the number of computational devices. And I'll use that term very broadly in the environment that we exist, that it's going to really require and necessitate collaboration amongst different hardware developers and leveraging each other's strengths and picking up different pieces that are available as opposed to doing it entirely in one company. I mean, I think as you know, the cost involved for the NRE, the non-refundable engineering cost to build product entirely by yourself is quite huge. The number of players that can actually do that are very, very few, right? So I think that as folks have different ideas and want to try to help move this forward, they're going to look to the open source community to help them. Yeah. yeah. I do want to call out that, um, you know, uh, there is a lot of people in the community already doing a lot of uh, stuff. Uh, people like Enjoy Digital, who originally started Litex and Lightram uh, related things. Um, in the tooling space, you've got groups like the Open Road Project, which has been funded with DARPA and uh, mainly hosted at UC San Diego. And then you've got uh, groups like uh, Yosis HQ and, um, you know, Claire and uh, other people working on like Yosis and those tooling. Um, none of this stuff is exclusively uh, developed by the people here. Um, almost all of it uh, exists in a community that has, uh, you know, uh, hobbyist, professionals, big companies, small companies, um, a wide variety of, uh, you know, different people um, who are interested in different wet, uh, different stuff and different uh, reasons. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think that, oh, sorry. Uh, one of the things that we need to be, be aware is that, you know, kind of this will take time 
And uh, I agree with Tim that you know, kind of, there's there's a lot of people involved. In fact, it's it's almost hard to mention everyone. And uh, we'll need to find the you know low hanging fruit and see the openings in what can be done with open source. And not everything can be done with open source today. Everyone always keeps pointing that out, right? And and that's ne never been our claim. Uh, but what we should be saying is much can be done with open source, more than you think. It's less than you would hope for, but more than you think. So how can we uh, enable and find those applications and focus on uh, the stuff that's uh, right behind the corner, you know? Uh, and of course, like, we should have this grand vision in front of us where we want a lot of things to be open source because that'll give people more control and freedom and collaboration. Uh, but uh, even today, Many of the things that uh, you might think are, are not yet possible with open source actually are, or at least you can kind of set yourself up so that you can use open source tools, you can use open source IPs if needed. Um, it's a, just a matter of, you know, uh, a little bit of goodwill sometimes and uh, uh, future oriented thinking, which is hard because, of course, people are used to doing uh, what they were doing before. And you can't really blame them for for kind of continuing on the track that they've known for years, but we should definitely uh, go and, and and calmly and uh, kind of uh, positively explain uh, what is indeed possible, and and that's what we're trying to kind of show with the practical scenarios and use cases and projects that that we're doing using open source. I would I think, add um, Libra BMC is a good example of that. Uh, you know, it brings together the open source tooling, it brings together Linux, it brings together open BMC. Um, you know, it's based a lot on the uh, work uh, Litex has done to be compatible with Linux. Um, you know, it's using a lot of stuff that was originally developed for Risk Five, but is now being reused uh, with the Power ISA. So um, there's a you know, a lot of different pieces to come together uh, to make this project work. I was just going to add, I think what folks will see is that there's a lot of enthusiasm and motivation in the community to make these things successful. So many, if you will, naysayers will say, well, that just isn't possible or you can't do that. And what I would say is in my ex brief experience so far with uh, Chips Alliance and the open source hardware community is that many things are possible and people are making things happen. And even if there are roadblocks that are encountered, there's a tremendous amount of ingenuity in the community that will help circumvent those challenges and make forward progress. Tim, do you, I have a question. Do you, you mentioned DARPA and the, kind of some of these government contracts. Do you What role do you see the government's playing in open source hardware? I mean, it's it seems it's, when people think about investments, uh, it's hardware it tends to be magnitudes of order more than what they tend to think of. Uh, do you see governments being playing a more pivotal role in open source hardware than say open source software? Um, I think they can. Um, whether or not they are at the moment is a very different uh, question. Um, when you look at some of the investments uh, governments all around the world are doing in, you know, uh, trying to do new hardware foundries, you know, you're talking billions of dollars. Um, if they just took a small percentage of that and invested it in um, an open source ecosystem around those foundries, I think we would see a um, massive change in the capabilities of hardware. Um, but I uh, frequently see uh, groups worried about, um, you know, uh, sovereignty in a way that is very exclusionary. Um, open source is really good and it makes it very easy to work with um, other nations, um, even if you're competing with them in the same way that it allows uh, competing companies to work together, you know. Microsoft, Google, Amazon are pretty fiercely competing in the cloud market, but we all contribute to things like Kubernetes and you know LLVM and all these other uh, you know core open source technologies because it's needed to uh, make the cloud work. And we could see the same in um, the ASIC and IC development world. You know the type of uh, things needed to make a modern chip work. Um, uh, 
should be open source so that uh, you can make it um, uh, easy to do the boring stuff that everybody needs to do. Uh, like everybody needs to talk to memory, storage, do input and output. Um, they might have some type of unique uh, thing that they want to do, but at the moment they have to do all this other stuff as well. How do we make it so that it's very easy for them to do just a little bit? Um, right. And, uh, you know, there's kind of this joke that at the moment a software startup is, you know, anybody with a laptop and $50 of cloud credits, um, you know, whereas a hardware startup is, you know, um, 50 employees and $100 million in capital. Um, right. The type of innovation you can get done when that, with that disparity is much, much smaller. Um, so how do we get it down so that anybody with $10,000 is, you know, a hardware startup? Um, and I think that's what we're trying to do. And I think governments could do a lot here. Um, they could invest very heavily in improving open source tools and, you know, uh, making these accessible and uh, collaborating more together, um, I think, uh, would be very helpful here. Um, I think uh, open source has been very successful in like the EU because of the kind of forced collaboration required between, uh, you know, uh, different countries in the European Union. Um, yeah, open source has enabled groups that otherwise would uh, be uh, unwilling to collaborate, to collaborate, uh, which has made things much better in um, uh, the environment. Yeah, I was just going to say, I saw, I know that, um, as maybe many do, but that the U.S. government just passed a quarter of a trillion dollar funding bill last night relative to uh, hardware technology and what goes into that. And so I think it is a good question to see how that impacts the overall landscape. I agree with Tim that, you know, trying to, uh, so to speak, shut down different collaborations or enabling in barriers probably is going to be more uh destructive than constructive, if you will. I, I mean, I appreciate the national security concerns that uh, different entities have, but uh, in general, it seems that the best innovation, again, comes from collaboration, and that's where disruption in comes. Yeah. And so I think it does come down to how to build a model that is su successful for that. Right. And uh, one thing is like, there aren't many people in the world who can afford to invest a couple of billion dollars in foundries. Um, you're not going to have a small group, uh, you know, uh, raise a billion dollars to create a foundry, you know, creating a foundry is a five year effort type thing. You know, uh, there are massive barriers to this anyway. Um, very little of it has to do with the technology side of things, um, you know. Well, um, we're, we're over time right now, but there is one question uh, from Alan Cantell. It says, uh, do you all see a need to cleanly decouple compute from memory, storage, and I.O. with a common shiplet type of low power interface? Michael, is, is this a question for you? <laughs> That's somewhat of a different theme. <laughs> uh, we do have, of course, a chiplet uh, focused work group in Chips Alliance. Yeah. We have uh, uh, the Interconnects work group, uh, which uh, covers things like AIB and Extend. Um, AIB is an open source chiplet technology, and I do believe chiplets are uh, a great idea for compositing, you know, very complex structures uh, from parts that are built with different process nodes, for example. So kind of decoupling complexity is a great uh, idea, whether it's gonna win as a trend uh, and whether it's gonna be available and accessible to a broader pool of people, we'll, we'll see. Obviously for, for very large companies, it's it's a very useful methodology and AMD mm -hmm. has shown that, right? Like you can move very fast and, and disrupt, um, but uh, whether it can be scaled to, to smaller uh, entities, hopefully yes, it would be really great yeah. if anyone could just build a little chiplet and uh, um, design it into a, a bigger chip and uh, that would make total sense from like software driven hardware perspective uh, and yeah. and yeah hopefully as chips alliance we can enable that um like yeah. chiplets i think are really interesting but um they suffer from a scale problem in that like 
chiplets should make uh, small scale manufacturing significantly easier, yet uh, none of the chiplet industry has been set up to do that. Um, you know, chiplets should fit somewhere between a PCB and, you know, a full custom ASIC. Um, and so you shouldn't need to commit to do a million units to do some type of chiplet. You should be able to do a couple of thousand units for a couple of thousand dollars. Um, but uh, nobody in the chiplet space has really done that. It's been very focused on the high end. Um, we did some experiments uh, um, a couple of years ago with a company called Zigaloo that was trying to do a lot more in this space um, of like making chiplets very fast and easy to um, do. Uh, but uh, the packaging uh, slowdown uh, was significant problem. Um, you know, I can get a, a high end PCB turned around in under a week. Um, if I have to wait six weeks or like three months to get my chiplet solution back, um, I'm probably better off just going with a um, HDI PCB. Um, and like that iteration speed is really, really important. And chiplets could solve that, but they haven't yet. And um, I think uh, that has less to do with standardization and more to do with business model. Um, uh, Mendy from IBM, who is, you know, uh, part of um, just a director of... Um, She's pre president of Open Power. President of Open Power likes to mention this, that uh, everybody's focused on, you know, the technology side of things um, and marketplace and, uh, you know, business dev for chiplets uh, still needs a lot of work and still needs a lot of figuring out. Um, I think open source has a lot of uh, use to play there, but um, as uh, you know, people in the open source world uh, know open source isn't a business model. It's, right. you know, um, a way, a technical solution again. So um, we need to figure out uh, where does chiplets um, fit? And, you know, um, I don't think, uh, the technology of whether it's like organic uh, things or silicon interposers or whether programmable or static or any of these um, is the most important problem to solve yet. I think uh, solving how do you make it so that uh, anybody can do chiplets at very low cost is much more important. Um, and uh, until that's solved, I think they'll continue to be a thing that only the big players use. And, you know, the big players would love uh, more people to do stuff in here so they could lower the cost. Um, I'm sure we would love more chiplets uh, be accessible on the market um, so we could just buy them rather than having to make them ourselves. But, um, you know, uh, Google's also a very demanding customer. Um, we have high um, end needs. And so um, the type of thing that you want to sell to us is going to be different to the type of thing you want to sell to um, the next Raspberry Pi, you know, solution and these type of things. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm excited about chiplets, but I think there's still a huge amount of problems that need to be, you know, solved and understood before we really find the killer app kind of for right. chiplets. Right. So I just gonna, I'm just gonna comment as well. So I think first in terms of the, uh, the cache protocol or separating CPU from the memory. I think that is an important aspect, particularly as we uh, see more and different types of accelerators and, you know, the necessary or necessity of different types of acceler accelerators, of course, vary based upon industry. I think having a chiplet ecosystem uh, could be a great enabler for that. I think as Tim correctly noted, or I guess I'll make two comments and part of this based upon my experience, but, uh, you know, multi-chip packaging, if you will, going back years to uh, either the TCM, which was originally seen on IBM mainframes, so that's thermal conduct, thermally cooled, thermal conduction module. Uh, you know, building those was expensive. Building MCMs, again, is expensive. I think uh, what AIB is enabling, and there are other protocols as well uh, that uh, could allow this, but uh, it would allow for a portfolio, if you will, of different types of chips that you could put together. But again, it's a challenge of uh, complexity and cost. The standards 
open standards that are evolving does help mitigate a lot of those problems that some companies cannot necessarily do on their own, right? It's not an easy problem, right? It's not just logical, it's also called physical, and that includes electrical, right? So there's a lot of challenges in that. But again, the manufacturing cost is an issue that has to be addressed, right? So I, I do appreciate that. Well, with that, uh, I know we're over time here. Everybody, thank you so much for uh, joining and uh, presenting. Uh, your take on open source hardware and what's going on, what you guys are working on. Uh, looking forward to collaborating with both uh, Michael and Tim and uh, Rob, obviously. We'll see much more of each other in the future um, as you guys stand up more work groups and we do too. Um, it's, this is all about open collaboration and to lower those costs, find those low hanging fruit and solve those problems. So thank you again for everybody for joining uh, and viewing. Talk to you soon. Thanks, thanks, thanks James. Bye-bye.